and the new things you hopefully will find are things that will serve others. Hi, I'm Cynthia Cortman Westfall, a Broadway music director, conductor, voice coach, and tenured professor in the musical theater department at the University of Michigan. And I'm Chelsea Wilson, a performer turned voice teacher to Broadway stars and vocal coach on Broadway productions like The Phantom of the Opera, School of Rock, and more. Here on the Broadway Vocal Coach Podcast, you can expect real talk about the business, practical advice, and constant encouragement. We believe there's space for every artist in this industry. All you need is the right support. So consider us your two-woman hype team. Welcome to the Broadway Vocal Coach Podcast, where we help musical theater performers get unstuck and take the next step in their careers. We recently sat down with Tony Award winner Gavin Creel for a transformative conversation. Every time I've had the pleasure to speak with Gavin, I leave inspired, amazed, and energized to, gosh, create more, love myself better. And this conversation is is really all of that wrapped up into an, an hour conversation. Cynthia, I feel like Gavin Creel doesn't need much of an introduction, but just in case folks want to know what Gavin's been up to, let's give it to him. Gavin Creel received a Tony Award for his performance as Cornelius Hackle in Hello, Dolly, starring Bette Midler. After making his Broadway debut originating the role of Jimmy Smith in Thoroughly Modern Millie, for which he received his first Tony Award nomination, Gavin went on to star in the Broadway productions of Hair, La Caja Fall, She Loves Me, The Book of Mormon, and Waitress. Most recently, Gavin was among the star-studded cast of the New York City Center Encore's a critically acclaimed production of Into the Woods, starring as The Wolf and Cinderella's Prince. That production transferred to Broadway, and Gavin is currently touring the country with a national tour. Gavin received an Olivier Award for his portrayal of Elder Price in the London production of The Book of Mormon. He also appeared on the West End in Mary Poppins, Hair, and Waitress. As a songwriter, Gavin is currently writing an original musical piece entitled Walk On Through, based on the collections at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Gavin was a co-founder of Broadway Impact, the first and only grassroots organization to mobilize the nationwide theater community in support of marriage equality. A native of Finley, Ohio, Gavin is a proud graduate of the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance, and a 2022 fellow at the Hermitage Artist Retreat. We are so honored to have Gavin on the podcast today. Let's get into the interview. Gavin, we are so excited to be talking with you today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy tour and negotiations and advocacy work (laughs) and all of the other things that you do. I've been looking forward to this since you asked me a while ago. I've really been looking forward to this day, so thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Yay. Well, I would love to sort of jump into a story that I don't know if you will even remember, but it's a story of how you and Chelsea first met. Oh, let's hear it. (laughs) I'm here to surprise you with the first time we met, Gavin. It was 2010. You were doing hair in London, and I was doing a semester abroad. I was doing a summer abroad in London, and (laughs) it wasn't a theater semester or anything like that, but I was seeing, I mean, literally everything I could, and I had tickets to see hair. And I showed up to the stage door before call time, hoping that I would run into you, you know, in a non-creepy way. And indeed I did. You were so kind. I said, hi, I'm a a current student at the University of Michigan. I'm seeing the show tonight. I just wanted to meet you and say hi. And you were so kind and so gracious. And you said, come back to the stage door after the show. I'll bring you backstage. You you can meet Will, who I was also a fan of. Still am a fan of, of course. And, yeah, me too. Me too. And and that's what happened. I saw the show that night. It was incredible. You had me backstage. And I have a picture as proof that I'd like to show you. Yep, here we are. <laughs> there we are. Oh backstage. My gosh. Look and at us. I just I just gotta say, I mean, that left such an impression on me. I was 20 at the time, and of course, looked up to you so much I was as a graduate. So that's uh, sweet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just a baby. Exactly. Just children. And I looked up yeah. to you so much as a graduate of the program that I was in. And you were just such an example of kindness and graciousness and going out of your way to let this young 20-something come backstage and meet you after the show. And it just left such an impression on me. And so I just want to say thank you. 
13 years later for that experience. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for telling me that. And also, I have to say, it's a little of a cheat to say I was nice because when you say University of Michigan or Go Blue or I'm in the program, I switch into another level of like intimacy. In, it, it's mm -hmm. an immediate thing. It's kind of the same thing when people say they've done hair. It's like this beautiful thing that links all of us. If you've done hair, we're kind of part of, it's called the tribe and hair. And it's just, we're all part of this one family. So that's kind of a neat convergence of like those two things. I, I have to say also what's changed for me now a little because of COVID is I can't say, like you said, I said to you, come backstage, I'll show you backstage and you can meet Will. That's just not something I say anymore. And also I am, it's not that I'm, mean i try to be as gracious as i can but like meeting people now it's very different experience and it's i'm still not sure what the new protocol is and i'm not gonna lie this is gonna sound really mean but i really love that backstage is just ours again mm. i don't miss the hordes of people that come in and sign on the list and the we're, we're oh hi oh hi like our show like we go outside and then we can say hi to people. But I really have loved, if I'm completely honest, when the show finishes, it's good night, Phil, my dresser. Good night, Catherine. Good night, Chelsea. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, good night. Where are you guys heading? I'll see you. Maybe I'll see you there. It's so nice that our space is is sacred. That said, I'm sure we'll get into a new a new kind of behavior. But for this time, I have really enjoyed it. Not to say I wouldn't have you back. I love you, dear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That makes sense. It's like the show after the show. It's like, you know, you're still on. You still have to be almost in a performance mode in that way. And I can imagine, yeah, it's just, a, it's a different, it's a different scenario now. Well, anyways, thank you. Yeah. Thank you a little late. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> so you're so welcome. So nice to see well, you again. <laughs> yeah. Let's get into it. We've got some juicy topics we want to discuss with you. <sighs> Let's juice it. I can't wait. Let's let's do it. I'll start. <laughs> let's go back to the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about your background and what your first big break was. My first big break was probably being selected as a soloist in the fifth and sixth grade choir glee club and ensemble. Kind of crushed Gary, Indiana. <laughs> I believe just it. I was gonna say. I didn't use the list though. For some reason I just decided to do just regular. Like he didn't have a list. I don't know why. This is kind of way back, but it was between Carnegie Mellon and Michigan, and I was dead set on going to Carnegie Mellon. And then something happened. I remember I was on a school bus and I was thinking about, you got to make a decision. And some, I had visited both schools, loved both schools. Something just clicked in me and I went, I'm going to Michigan. It was almost, <laughs> it was my first adult decision that I felt spiritually led to. It was mine to make. And up to that point, there's a lot of influence and stuff. But I will say when I was at Michigan, it was, it was notorious when I was there 25 years ago. It was my, my it's 25th anniversary this year. It's just insane of graduating. It was customary not to be cast in a show. It was rare that sophomores were cast in shows in the fall semester. And I was one of four sophomores that was cast in the fall show. And that felt like a big break to me. That mm. felt like I was seen in a way that I can't really... I think it's been so long that I've had such opportunities happen to me or for me that it's hard for me to distinguish where my confidence comes from. Cause I think I have confidence or I just, but it's because I've been, I've been given opportunities. I've been smiled upon. I have had light shown on me. Yes. I'm talented. Yes. I have ability, but so does a million other people. M Michigan is like chock full of talent and charisma and people who are incredible. But that opportunity feels like a big break to me, if I can say that. Obviously, getting workshops and readings in the beginning of my career in New York were big moments. I did workshops of Hairspray and Spring Awakening and Wicked and big, big shows. And, my, and getting cast as Jimmy in Thoroughly Modern Millie would maybe be my, was my huge, huge big break on Broadway. But I have to say, being cast in the musical review of Oh Coward, my sophomore year, <laughs> with three other sophomores felt very special and was not lost on me. And I have not thought about that till just now. Wow. I love that so yeah. much. Yeah. So that leads me to another question because tell me if I'm wrong, it feels like you did some workshops, but you kind of hit it fairly big, fairly quickly. If we look back in retrospect anyway. Oh yeah. I was really lucky. 
So I'm curious, I feel like a lot of actors will have, you know, some years of experience as an ensemble or as a swing or a standby. You kind of hit that lead track pretty quickly and you've mm-hmm. kind of stayed there for the most part. And I'm curious, what does it feel like to to carry a show? Is there a responsibility that you feel as a lead, mm. both to the production, to your fellow actors, to the crew? You know, how soon did you figure that out? I felt the worst imposter syndrome in Millie. I felt I did not belong there. I felt like, I I honestly, it was a rough, really rough rehearsal process for me. I felt like I was gonna get fired the whole time. I never really felt secure in the job until weirdly enough, I injured myself in previews. And then all of a sudden this creative team was like, are you okay? And I was like, huh, you know, it's funny. I don't, I have not felt this love before. I was really scared and nervous. And it set me off on a bit of a, path if i'm if i'm honest again to it was painful to because i was scared the whole time and it and it sort of put a fear in me with the business that it's taken me a long time to to try to get past but it was when i was 30 and i was doing mary poppins in london where i sort of realized there oh there's a responsibility here when you play the lead to the company backstage relationship morale checking in on people i watched sutton do it in millie she would on saturdays between shows before the second show, she would go around in her robe and slippers because she was a chorus girl. And she felt lonely down there in, in the big dressing room with the big starring role. And she would come up in her robe. She would warm up early on Saturdays between shows and just visit and say hi in all the dressing rooms. Gary Beach would do a similar thing in La Caja Fall. Sutton would do bagels. Still does, I think. Does bagels on, does. on on, sat- on does. Saturday between <laughs> Yes. Yep. I started doing parties, donuts. Like You just realize by watching other leaders and some shows that doesn't have them. That's kind of my favorite role in a show is checking in, looking around, seeing how I can help throw a party once in a while. One of my co-stars I noticed was having a rough day during a rehearsal the other day. And without going over to them, I was just like, okay, I'm just going to check it. And then I texted them and I was like, Hey, just want to know, are you, you okay? I'm here. If you need anything, I'm here. I saw them. A little bit later that night, I, d- I did not say anything. And then they came up to me and gave me a hug. I'm like, I really appreciated that. And we didn't really get into it. But it's just, it's a, it's a really heavy, hard job that looks really fun and frivolous most of the time. And I'm now realizing how important that leadership position is to keep the, the joy. Yeah. Oh, I love that. How is it different now being on Into the Woods where there isn't sort of a clear lead? You're sort of all leads in your own way. Is, how does How is that structure feeling different? Great question. You know, I got to say, because it's ensemble based, everybody's kind of present in their own way, What where, where they do well, whether it's morale boosting or being funny cut up backstage or being a bit of a mother or checking in on people. It's, it's, it's beautifully spread. And I think also the industry is trying to change so that there is not a a hierarchy and a, you be quiet and you can talk. We're trying to rebalance that in a way. And it's hard. I do think it's really hard in educational systems right now, especially in colleges, because the students are very different and coming at us all in a very different way than we did. Yeah. And some of them, some of the ways I think are, are overreaching, but most I think are actually helping me to understand, wow, I might have been abused in ways that I had no idea. I might have been made to feel small so that there could be power placed in certain areas. So what's neat about Into the Woods is we're trying to like, I'm trying to breathe through when somebody does something that makes me want to roll my eyes. I go, no, this is what equitability looks like. Everybody has a voice and everybody should be feel free to speak up of what they have problems or concerns. And we're doing pretty well, I think. Not without its bumps, but I think we're doing pretty well. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Here's another question I always have, because I've known now that I've been in the business for over 30 years. <laughs> Isn't that weird to say? It's it so weird. It is so weird to say. I know. I've had in my own experience and, and in, you know, actors I've known over the years, this idea that from the outside looks like you're constantly working, looks like your career is going like gangbusters all the time. Mm-hmm. Those of us in it know that there are, you know, sometimes like even if there's maybe only six months between the show that you closed and the show that you open, that was six months when you didn't know when the next job was coming or if the next job was coming or what that might look like. I would even say one better. 
One month. Two months. One month. Great. That, you yeah, know what talk I mean? To us, talk to us about that. What is that like to, on the outside, look so successful? Tell us what that experience yeah. is like for you, because I know it's different on the inside than it is looking from the outside. Well, I have two things to say. One is about the time, the time thing you're just talking about. I have realized because of the pandemic, in a deeper, more meaningful, more powerful, more painful way, what it is to have nothing. And by nothing, I mean, I, I lived well. I am, I am so privileged and have had such opportunity and I don't have dependents, you know, so I want to be clear that I know my, my privilege. That said, I wasn't allowed to do the thing that I love doing. I lost my voice for a year and a half in the middle of the pandemic. I thought I had damage. I had nothing. I, I had grief. I had a lot of loss during that time, as we all did. But when I came back to Into the Woods, I was like, do I remember how to do this? I was really kind of nervous to be in a rehearsal room again because it had been years since I'd done it. And I will say, I don't know that I would be doing the national tour of Into the Woods had it not been for that time because I see it all differently. I appreciate it so much more. I just see the value of having purpose. That's the biggest thing. I, I took for granted the purpose of just getting to go to a theater and be with people, even if it is, yes, telling the same story over and over again. It's different now. It's like, I get to do this. And I think I might have taken it for granted. And the other thing is something that I want to say that I said I had the privilege of being a part of the New Works Festival, the first ever New Works Festival at Michigan this, this January. And I stood in front of the students that were in my group. And I looked at them at the end of a warm up. We did this really physical warm up. I was kind of panting and sweating. And I was like, all right, we're all in this elevated space right now. I want to tell you the truth about Gavin Creel. This person that you see in front of you, I don't know who that is. I don't know who Gavin Creel is that you see. And, and I, I know who he is in here. And he feels not as far from you as I feel from you. Like you see me and you think I am way down the track and way established and successful and working all the time and all these myths. I feel when I step back in the Towsley or the Power Center rehearsal room or any rehearsal room, the piano and hardwood floor and mirror, I'm you again. I'm a college student and I'm like, God, do I know what I'm doing? Do I know what this is? And it's something that's really dawned on me that <laughs> the distance from me to younger people people aspiring to do this is this big. Whereas I think the distance from their vantage point to me feels like an infinity. And I just want them to hear, I hear you that it feels like an infinity, but I also need you to hear me that the only thing I wish to do with teaching, with performing masterclasses, this is demystify that distance. I want to just, I want to just gently take it away and go, we really are more on an equal plane than anyone thinks. And the people who try to make us feel small or make you feel like there's this gulf, I'm not really that interested in working with anymore. So now that you've mentioned doing this new works festival, segue into segue. what's happening. We're, we might have to go a little non-chronologically for you, Gavin, because there's a couple questions I'm going to need to ask you about some earlier times. But since Great, we are on do. this new works, <laughs> this new works yeah. thing, Talk to yeah. us about your writing and your composing. And yeah. I had the privilege of being sent to our video of Walk On Through. So talk to us about Walk On Through, about, about your other writing and, and just this new world you're sort of shifting into. Thank you. I, the, I started writing songs at the piano as a kid, just, you know, ditties. And then when I was 20, I was doing, I was in the ensemble of the Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera the summer after my junior year. And I wrote my first official song. And Heather Mazur, who was in the ensemble, sat next on the floor next to the piano bench. And I was like, can I play you something? And she sat there in an empty rehearsal room. And I sort of, I'm going to credit her for the rest of my life as the person who actually allowed me to be a songwriter. Because when I finished, she was like, I don't know if she was in tears, but she was just like, oh my God, what was that? And she, it could have gone one of two ways. She could have been like, oh, that was nice. <laughs> and she didn't. And it encouraged that. So I, I start by saying that's what my show is kind of about is anybody who's ever tried to make anything knows it. You have to love it. There has to be a love there. And I would even go further to say there has to be somebody who looks you in the eyes and says, oh, 
I'm so proud of you for trying to make that. So she started me off and I, I wrote songs through my 20s and 30s. I started writing independent records. I have like three independent records. One song, Good Time Nation, a little EP called Quiet, and another little EP called Get Out. And I'm really proud of all of that writing. Those were all collaborations, but I always knew I kind of wanted to make a theater piece. But I started working with, with collaborators, but then I realized, oh, I think what I really want to do is try to do this on my own. I have voices in my head that I, I want to get down. Cut to, I got, I got offered this sort of partnership with the Metropolitan Museum of Art where a friend of mine worked there on the development team. And he said, I, there's this curatorial department called the Met Live Art Series. They basically give membership cards to people in various industries, theater, musical theater, opera, instrumentalists, choreographers, directors, all different walks of performing life. And they say, come to the museum and here's a free card, a membership. And when you come up with an idea inspired by the art, let us know and we'll help you present a piece to the public. Oh, that's so that's cool. Incredible. What a cool and concept. What an that's honor really also amazing. to be to be yeah. collaborating with the Met. Are you kidding? It's incredible. Yeah. Even more incredible is that I had never been there. And that's that's the whole thing. I was like, <laughs> I am not a museum show, right? person. Oh my god. That's gosh. literally the plot of the show. It's it's a guy who's in who's having a midlife moment and is in this apparently successful, beautiful life that everybody thinks is perfect is in a real breaking point of loneliness. And they asked me, so what do you think? What do you think you want to do after like wandering around for almost a year? And I said, I think the only thing I can think of really, actually it's probably like six months I'd been walking at that point. And I said, I have to tell the truth that I've never been here before. And it's going to be about a guy who I'm just going to do a concert and I'm going to try to look at art and then tell you what I felt or thought or saw or experienced. And I'll just kind of out myself as a museum dummy. And, and it's developed into something far deeper than I could ever have imagined. And the hope is that we're going to have a production. I'll say it here. I'm, I'm hoping we'll have a production in the fall, a small production that we can grow. My dream is to do a limited run on Broadway. And then I want to tour it around the world. I just want to share because what I think the universality of the piece is loneliness. And, 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 and the first line of the play you hear is, where am I in this place? Who am I meant to be in this world, in this space? Can I find me? And it's the most basic thing, but it is the most epic feeling for so many people who struggle in silence on their own in the world. And even people like Julia Roberts may be very lonely in her Malibu beach house. You know, no matter how much you have or how successful you are or appear to be, life is hard. And I say that without any pity in myself because of what we lived through in the pandemic. I, I just, I understand things less and more than I could ever have imagined now. And I'm trying to put that into art with this piece. It's intimidating. It's massive. I am rewriting parts of it already from what you will have seen, Cynthia already working on trying to tighten things up and make it clear or whatever, but I'm learning so much about creation and I love slash I'm terrified slash liberated by the process of writing. I it's such a beautiful work. This. What I've seen Thank so far, you. it's so beautiful. And I, I love know. how there's humor threaded throughout. That's something I've always loved about you is that even in the dark times, you find a way to thread a little bit of humor in, which there's also something about your writing that I feel like instantly, for me anyway, it's my experience, I instantly go into my own world of it and how oh. I resonate in my own life with it, if that makes sense. That's the best thing you could say. I, I, I'm so, that's what I want. I It's not mine. Yeah. I don't think any of what we do or create, I feel like it's it's borrowed. And when I pass it to you, that's what I think it's supposed to do. It's like, yeah. what do you think? The fact that you thread these unexpected tiny moments of humor throughout is honestly what allowed me last night to stay on the journey. You've made me feel safe. I feel safe already. We've had some jokes. We've had some Good. funny levity. and <laughs> But, you know, even that, knowing knowing that you've prepped us. So I'm excited. The thing the thing that I, I will say about the second half with this, this presentation is something I think a lot of artists and creators think about. It's what I'm thinking about now as I am trying to get to a better version of what I have already is 
am, am I enough at my simplest form to be compelling? And I think what I found when I was at the New Works Festival that I kept saying over and over to them is I'm giving where we were at in our piece. It's, it wasn't a piece. It was a pile of songs that I wanted to know. Can I use a process to explore with these students? There's no characters. There are stories in all the songs, but I'm asking them, what is the story to you? I'm asking you to look at yourself. So I kept saying to them, I'm actually asking you to take away. Don't add to. Don't put on a voice. Don't become a character. I'm actually asking you to, to pull layers away to get to you and then just say the lines. And I think as an actor, that's actually what we should be doing when we're creating characters is don't put stuff on it. Take away. Look within. And I read this amazing book. I just finished it called From Strength to Strength by Albert C. Brooks. That's about finding happiness in the second half of life where things start Writing to decline. Down immediately. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Cynthia. It is an incredible, incredible book. He talks about the fluid intelligence curve. And it always declines. Everyone peaks and declines. And then we're trying to pull ourselves back up onto that height. He said, the only way to find satisfaction in life is to jump to your crystallized intelligence curve. And it's doing what you're doing. It's what you two are doing with this. It's what I hope to do. And I continue to try to do with leadership, mentorship, teaching, is to act in service to other human beings, to try to provide something that gives you satisfaction, but is actually about making the world better. And he says, I want you to envision a piece of art, a creation that has not been started yet. What do you picture? What, what are some of the first things you picture? A piece of art that's not been started. Is there anything you picture that jumps to mind? I went to sculpture with choral music on top of it. Wow. It was a double oh, whammy yes. of like wow. performance art of sculpture and choral music. And I have resisted writing music very successfully for my entire life. So... That makes me partially anxious, partially mad at you for bringing that back up again because I've successfully <laughs> resisted it for all these years. <laughs> so you do you see do you see blank staves in front of you or like do you see a no, piano I heard it. waiting? I heard you it. Heard it. Mm -hmm. Hey, because what I saw and what he says in the book, I, he says a lot of people in the Western culture will see a blank canvas. If I said a piece of art has not been made, you see blankness. You see a tapestry waiting to be embroidered. Mm -hmm. You hear music waiting to be sung. He said in Eastern philosophy, they said, it's kind of like what you said with sculpture. They see a block of rock. They said the art is already there. You have to chip away to find it. The art already exists. Mm. And we in Western philosophy think we have to put things on. We have to like mm -hmm. get our pencils out and whatever. In a weird way, you went Eastern, Cynthia, because you already hear it. And yet there's a stoppage, which is totally fine. You don't have to make anything for the rest of your life to be satisfied. If there's an itching, it's like, oh, do I want to scratch it? Do I want to? You don't, you don't have to. It's totally fine. But what if it's just a bar or a, a verse chorus or, I don't know, just two parts? And I, I found it very yeah. encouraging to take things away is also allowed. Like the jade, he said, a block of jade, the sculpture we see before us. The sculpture was always in there. It's that great mm -hmm. saying about like chip away anything that's not elephant. If you're going to sculpt mm -hmm. an elephant, just how do you do it? We'll chip yep. away anything that's not an elephant. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I love that idea. Well, it's interesting because it, you know, for me, the fact that I use words like I've resisted successfully mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I literally heard it while seeing the block of sculpture tells me perhaps it's actually there and it's fear you know we all have that fear of it won't be good enough someone's already done it someone's yeah. already done it better no one's gonna yeah. care and I've really in my later years have latched on as Chelsea knows I've latched on to things one of my favorite quotes right now is from Elizabeth Gilbert that is find the thing that you love to do so much that the words success and failure virtually become irrelevant yes. and, and I sort of love that idea of like maybe I'll go write down what I heard today in my brain when you asked me that question and you Please. know what Who cares? success and failure irrelevant it's art is art it's just a beautiful thing just by virtue of being art I would say the thing that I hear when you say that fear which I have 15 breaths out of 20 every minute but I, I would say if I zoom in on what that really is about for me, I think I, I 
go to a place of the enough thing again. Like, am I enough? Am I compelling enough? Are my ideas enough? And my answer to myself gently is always, of course it is, because no one else is you. There's never been another you ever. But leaving that aside, I sort of feel like with creating things, it takes a daring, a real courage to do it. That once you just do it, just the first step, you're already 75% further than most people, including this guy right now who has yet to write a new song in a while. It's always there for us if we want it. I said this the other day when I was talking to somebody about condescension is like one of my absolute least favorite things. It's maybe my thing I hate the most. And I went, okay, let's, let's spend a little time on that. Zoom in on that, Gavin. Why do you hate it the most? Why is condescension so offensive to you? It's offensive to a lot of people, but why is it to me? Because I'm inside this body. And you know what I think I discovered was when somebody tells you that's terrible, Cynthia, or that's good, Cynthia, and it can be irrelevant, I think it's because you don't say it to yourself. Like if you think what you made is good, I, I got to a point with my writing where I went, you are a good songwriter, Gavin. So therefore, you don't need anyone else to tell you that. You can tell yourself mm -hmm. that. If I can tell myself that, then when you go, I don't like his songs, I go, oh, cool. My songs are just not for you, but I actually know my songs are good. I believed it for myself, independent. It took me a long time to get there. And part of it was fake it till you make it. I had to tell myself, you're allowed to just start saying this to yourself. It's not arrogance. It's not even confidence. It's just knowing. It's peace. With that, do you feel like the the imposter syndrome that you talked about going into Millie, do you feel like you've allowed yourself to shed that and and say, no, I, I lead this company, I yeah. lead this show, and and in all aspects of your career, not just writing? Because I've done acting and, and company leadership and that kind of thing for so long, I do think I have shed the imposter yeah. syndrome there. I'm not going to lie. I'm trying to find the bothness of intrinsic and extrinsic because I spent, I spent a lot more time getting my value and my worth from outside forces that I'm like the pandemic took that away. There were no outside right. forces. There was no applause. There was no positive feedback loop that Celia, my best friend and I talk about all the time. There was no people smiling. There was nobody touching me. There was no one to love me. So I had to go, okay, I don't know if I'm going to survive this. I literally was like, I don't know. I wasn't going to hurt myself, but I did not know how I was going to go forward that's your work. You need to work on the intrinsic. And, and that is something I'm going to have to balance at all times. I just wanted to go back to the condescension yeah. thing. I realized why it bothered me so much was because I was talking to myself in a condescending tone. The, the dialogue inside me was saying, you suck. And I think a lot of us know that voice. So I'm like, if I can change gently, change that voice inside me, and I would say with Cynthia, you're, the fear, yeah, of course, I'm afraid. Every song I write, I'm like, whoop, that was the last one. I <laughs> don't know if I got dry, dry well. If I can go, no, it's not, Gavin. You just don't want to right now. Or you're not feeling inspired or whatever. Then when somebody says, you can't write another song, I go, well, that's hilarious because that has no effect on me. Success, failure, or you're not a good songwriter, or you're not a good actor, I spent a long time trying to protect myself from people telling me bad news about my acting by saying, I don't like acting. That was a mm. cop out on my part because I, I actually do think acting is bullshit a lot of the time, but that's because there's just certain things that I just don't like about certain approaches. But if I can let myself say, it's fun and you like it and you're good at it. And there's certain characters you don't feel good in because you shouldn't play them because you're not actually in your center of your power. And you don't have to play everything and you don't have to know how to do everything because Cynthia can play that part or Chelsea can play that part or, you know, anybody else. And I don't have to know how to do everything. Collaborating is like the best thing about songwriting is like, oh, I don't have to write Walk On Through by myself now because it's not my piece anymore. It's Linda, my director's piece and Madeline, my music director and Chris, my arranger and our amazing band and our lighting designer and our sound designer and this amazing producing team. and is very freeing to me. Can I follow up on, you said something that just really sparked with me, which was we don't have to be everything or do everything well. I feel like today in this day and age, that is very much how everybody feels. 
that the the you know the young folks coming up into the business feels like I have to be able to sing in every single style and in every single voice quality and I have to be able to play any kind of character and I have to be able to dance in all of the styles. I'm curious how you having I know the business has changed a lot since you first entered yeah. it. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> It's, it's, I first want to hold all those people who have those fears and those thoughts. I got you. I hear that. And that's real. And that, and the panic that that probably initiates feels debilitating. And that's really hard to hold, especially when there's 25 years ago, there were 25 years less students who had come out of these programs. There were way less programs preparing. And and can I also say there were 25 fewer styles Yes. Yeah. yes. Do you know what I mean? Less going on. I mean, yes. even since I started the 20 years from since I've taught at Michigan, the the different number of styles and genres and types of music that we're hearing and choreography mm-hmm. that we're seeing is so much more varied than it was 20, 30 years ago. I would say even what you just said then to anyone listening, let that be your friend. That is the truth. You just told me the truth that it is more expensive and there's more people and there's more programs. So cut yourself some slack. It's a tough business. This is a tough thing to do. It's not easy. I can say a million things about it, but the things that leap to mind are when you're pursuing anything that you want and you don't yet have, to get it simply and easily, it will then not have value. So a little of the challenge and a little bit of the hustle, it's good so that you value it when you have it. Like I said earlier, this pandemic, my ego would have gotten in my own way saying, I don't want to play a wolf on a tour of a show that I was supposed to do for two weeks at City Center. My ego would have been like, you should be playing the witch, not the wolf. <laughs> I don't know. You know, <laughs> I, that's my ego. And it's there. But also, I wanted to play the baker. I want to, I should, I want to play the baker. I don't want to play a supporting part again, again. How lucky am I to get to be asked? And I talked to Leah. I said, give me a night so I can get over my ego. I absolutely said that to her on the phone call. She says, I hear you. She says, you're not what I'm looking for for the baker. Mm-hmm. I think somebody was already cast at that point. And then, and then that person left. And I was like, well, they, but at that point, I was already in love with the prince and the wolf. But I, I, I got over my ego of like wanting to play the lead. And I saw the extreme value of this. So I would say, assess what's your responsibility to check yourself and your own ego And the other thing I would say is if you're trying to source extrinsically your worth and your joy from an industry that does not have a heartbeat, that does not care about you, that's just the truth. It doesn't, it's not a thing. Broadway is an energy. It's a street with some real estate on it that frankly, if we're going to be true, true, brutally honest and unregulated for business families decide what's going to be put, it's real estate. And I've worked for three of those families and they all have their strengths and they all have their weaknesses. And I'm, but it's not like a fair thing. It's that day, the Schubert's decide, I don't want that show in our theater. So, but I want this one. And you go, well, this one's so much better. What does that even mean? Everything is subjective. And to get mad at an industry that's based on opinion about who sits behind a table. Yes, we can move things. We can try to change things. And I want to talk endlessly about the ways that this has not been an equitable business and continues to give opportunities to people who get them again and again. But I, to that, I also say, try not to source your value, Gavin, from an industry that's based on opinion. It's just about like, well, I just don't like Gavin's voice. Okay. Well, I think I'm a really good singer, so I don't want to be in your show if you don't like my voice. <laughs> Cause then I'm going to be always trying to like sing well for you and make you like my voice. No. You know, yeah. People see me audition and they're like, no, I'm bored by him. Okay. Thank you for saving me from your show. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Bye. Amen. I just think that conversation, especially for young people about not outsourcing your value, not outsourcing your inherent worthiness, no one's going to give that to you. Truly, no one, no one is going to do you justice. And Mm -hmm. that was hard for me. I mean, I, my situation was I, I didn't perform on Broadway. I didn't perform professionally for very long. And so when I stepped away and said, 
look at this amazing pedigree of University of Michigan graduate, but I'm going to step away mm. and do this other thing. It was so embarrassing. It was so because it's I so had hard. found it's yeah, I'd found my worth as so many young people do and and as is somewhat necessary for a time, right? Like you were saying someone smiled upon you, someone gave you opportunity. That's how we at, at first, you know, know there's something within us that's worth pursuing or or a little special or a little mm. different, right? I, I don't think that's wrong in any way. But at some point as adults and young adults, it is vital for our own mental and emotional health that we let go of it being someone else's responsibility to tell us that we're worthwhile and that we're worthy Oof. and that we're good. That's it. That is it, Chelsea. That isn't it, Cynthia? It's like Yeah. yeah. And 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 I'm gonna get a tattoo on this tour, I think. It's going to say both, and that everything is both. It's not, mm. I always thought, well, if I don't want to be in this relationship, then I must want to be alone and I shouldn't be able to be with anybody. And I'm like, no, that's miserable too. It's solitude and it's companionship. It's, it's validating yourself and also having somebody say, Chelsea, you're an incredible performer. When I listen to you sing, I, I could listen to you sing all day. Who doesn't love an affirmation like that? Who doesn't need an Who affirmation need like it? that? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We all do. We need. We all need that smile. So I want to. Whenever I had people in my class, most of who are not performers anymore from my graduating class, whenever I heard one of them saying "I'm done," to me they were the winners. They were the most courageous because they walked away from something that they publicly stated they were going to be. They publicly stated that they wanted, but what they put first and foremost was their happiness. I know I sit in a privileged position to be able to say this because I have been on Broadway. I've been nominated for, a Tony, I've won an Tony Award. All these, these things that we all have said, oh, I just want to be a lead in the show. I just want to win an award. I want, all that is a kick in a can down the road. Because once you win the award, and I can speak from this from experience, you realize my phone literally did not ring any more than it had before. Nothing changed except that now I have a $75 paperweight that spins on my bookshelf. You know, <laughs> I have a title. The title is nice, but the Gavin yeah. Creel Tony Award winner, Gavin Creel, that's a person that you know that I don't know. I'm still the guy who's experimenting with his hair color and trying to figure out what his next song is and is looking for a way to jump to that crystallized intelligence curve that Arthur Brooks talks about. It's worth a read because it's coming for all of us. And it's making yes. us realize there is value. I'm trying to, with my therapist, with my meditation practice, with my outing myself to this podcast, I'm trying to talk about, process, and value my aging, my voice changing. I hear recordings of me when I was 25 and I go, I can't sing like that anymore. I don't have that range. I don't have that facility. And I think, oh, do I need to get back into voice lessons and really train? Probably. But do I want to? No. I don't. I think about my body all the time. All, my whole life has been governed by my body. My shame of my body, my shame of my sexuality, my shame of my appearance. I'm trying to, even now, at four, I'll be 47 in April, even now, I'm still trying to grapple with, am I good looking enough to have a partner? Am I good looking enough to be cast as a romantic leading man? Am I young enough to be a romantic leading man anymore? The answer is probably no. But I still feel young in here. I worry, is there going to be irrelevance? Am I, am I not cool to young people anymore? That's me still trying to outsource my worth to the approval of a generation that doesn't even know who the fuck I am. They don't care. They care about, I'm not even going to name them, but you can fill in the blank, the younger, cuter guy who is in musical theater, who they know, who's on TikTok. BB, I don't give a toot about TikTok. I cannot, I don't have enough hours in the day to start making TikTok videos. I will hire somebody to do it for walk on through for sure. <laughs> but like, these are all the things that I grapple with and I go, meditate, breathe. You are enough. You do have worth. You do have talent. You are going to find new things and the new things you hopefully will find are things that will serve others. And I'm hoping Walk on through, my dream is that will it succeed, play Broadway, tour. The truth is, it may never get further than the two of your computers. <laughs> and as much as that makes me sad, I, I hope it will go farther than that. But that has to be enough. That has to be enough. Because 
then I'm just kicking that can down the road is like, well, then then walk on through, we'll, we'll get the approval. And no, I have to give myself that approval now. And I have to hear, you asked me to be a part of your podcast. Do you know what an honor that is? Like to be asked to share and talk about things that's happening right now. We are having a dialogue and an energy exchange that has to do with the Gavin Creel that you might know that I don't, but I'm aware of. And I have the privilege, the honor of getting to share my ideas with the two of you who are trying to share your ideas with an audience of people. That is an honor that is, does not, it will not take for granted anymore. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's heartbreaking for us to see so many students and parents right where you are that know what they want, but are struggling because they don't have a plan to get there. Looking to apply to college musical theater programs? If you're frustrated by the process already, here's the solution you've been waiting for. Since Cynthia and I had never seen a program that took a personalized and all-encompassing approach to all of the needs of college prep, we decided to create it ourselves. What we do at BBC Aspire, our four-month college prep program, is work with folks just like you to build a personalized roadmap to achieve your goals with all of the training and resources you need in one place. BBC Aspire is our four-month college audition prep program for rising high school seniors, or gap year folks. If that's you or your child, then this is where you need to be. And here's why it works. Aspire includes everything you need to successfully apply to college programs within a fixed yet flexible four-month time period, June through September. It's a fixed price, so there's no surprise costs, and you get your applications in at the start of senior year, saving you months of stress and opening up time for all the other stuff you want and need to do, like your school show or a part-time job. Registration is open now and doors close on May 15th. We have limited spots available for our 2023 program and we're already at 50% capacity. So now is the time to act. Sign up for BBC Aspire and get the edge you need to succeed in the highly competitive world of musical theater. Ready to get stressing over college audition prep off your plate? Schedule a free consult with us. Email hello at bwayvocalcoach.com or check the link in our show notes to book a call. Talk to you soon. Gavin, there's something I've always wanted to ask you. I, I've, I've heard you talk a little bit about this, but we've in previous podcasts talked a lot about social media, how to do it healthily, how it can be beneficial, how it can be good for a career. What are some things you can do that are good for a career? You are sort of famously not much on social media. Can you tell us a little about that? I'd love, I just I'm, would love to know your thoughts on that. This is my new thought. I am completely out of touch. Young people will listen to me and say, <laughs> I'm sorry, but the world is moving on without you. And I understand that. I, I, I got a new concert agent during the pandemic and she said, you have to get back on Instagram. You need to have a place people can go to find stuff. I'm there. I try not to check it much. The reason I don't want to be on these things is because then I will do these things all the time. It's bad for my anxiety. It, it makes me feel compare and despair anxiety. And I kind of love the blissful ignorance of it. That said, I'm making a piece of art that I want everyone to see. And if I don't have a presence on social media, if the show doesn't have a presence on social media, I'm just shooting myself in the foot. So mm -hmm. young people are not intimidated by it in the way that I am because they have grown up with it. It's like in their blood. I also don't think they take it as personally as I do. I'm wounded by it in ways that they're like, oh, whatever, who cares? And I find that inspiring. So my tune is changing a bit about it. I used to get on a soapbox about how what I thought it was doing to the world and to our brains. Arthur Brooks' book, he gets soapboxy about what it's doing to our development. There's plenty of people out there who say the yays and the nays of it. I will say we're in the theater and I stand by what I said after I was in the press room after the Tony, my Tony getting the award. And they said, what would you say to young people? I said, just get off your phone. And I said, for, for theater, put your phone down, watch the rehearsal room, listen to what the director's saying, be bored. Boredom is where I get so much creativity. Boredom leads to irritation with self and irritation with self makes me, oh, let's go take a walk. I'm going to go to the Smithsonian. I've been sitting in the house in this beautiful place that my friend is letting me stay at while I'm in DC in this bay window, in this rotating chair, reading books. I don't, I'm not a big reader, but I'm reading books and I'm thinking about, should I get out of this chair and stop reading and go to the Smithsonian? I'll get there when I'm ready. But 
the, my boredom with myself, like, and I'm on my phone sometimes. So I just, I think there's no answer to it. My suggestion is find a balance. And, and I, I proudly don't follow anybody on Instagram because I don't need to see what you're up to. I need to call you and ask. And if I don't know you, I don't really need to see because all that's going to do is make me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very wise. I think you're not alone in yeah. in those feelings. And finding the balance is hard. Like you don't ever find it. You just seek it. And that's all we can do is hope that we we seek it along the way. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One more sort of light question. And then we, we have kind of a little wrap up we like to do with all of our special guests. <laughs> I love it. Can't wait. Can't wait. Here's the light question, which maybe isn't that light of a question, but what what was it like winning a Tony? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it was just awesome. What are the, or I should say, what are the fun parts of winning a Tony? My outfit. I was really proud of my outfit. Jeff Mashey yes. designed the most beautiful sort of 70s, a little bit 70s inspired, beautiful velvet coat. I had these Cartier buttons, studs. Milan Breton, a fashion designer, built Jeff's design beautifully. My outfit was one of my favorite parts. Also, I, the whole thing was, uh, I've, uh, the only reason I ever wanted to win a Tony, besides getting to call yourself a Tony Award winner, was to make a speech. And I was really proud of my speech because it spoke mm. about my alma mater and about people raising money for scholarships. I, I thought about like, what do I want to say? And I had years, years I practiced. I'll out myself. I, I imagine what would it be? What would I say? I always knew it was going to be about education in some way, but I, I practiced my speech because I knew I would curse on national television. If I didn't, when I get nervous, I say the F word <laughs> or I get excited. I just start, that seems to be my filler. So I practiced it. I remember being just concise, don't get played off. And then the rest of the night was just lovely. I was with my cast and my the friends and my partner at the time. And we were just having a really beautiful night where I was with my friends in the bathroom of the Carlisle Penthouse Hotel, the party, the after party, Rick Miramontes throws this infamous party, this famous party, where it's like, who's who shoulder to shoulder in this suite at like two in the morning. I mean, I, I opened the door and Sally Field and her son are standing there. I'm holding a Tony Award and she's like, oh, congratulations, I'm like, Sally Field. <laughs> and then I go into the bathroom. Every, everybody's in every room of this apartment at this, yeah. this huge suite at the Carlisle, the 23rd floor. And it's packed with people and you're just looking around and everybody's drinking champagne and it feels like old Hollywood, New York, everything all mashed into one. And I went into the bathroom and in the bathroom was Ben Platt with his Tony, Beanie Feldstein, Taylor Trench, Casey Levy, me, Kate Baldwin. We're all smushed in there. And we're all sitting on the toilet holding Tony words and going, we're kids. How do we get this? How did they give us these? Just laughing. It was a dream. A really beautiful dream night. And then I got home at the end of the night and my building had decorated my door with all these Tony oh, Ward stuff and said, congratulations. Oh they all went up and smushed love letters all over my door. So when I got home, it was like one last surprise. That's so sweet. It well, I can share with you, I happened to be on that Tony night on a balcony in Redondo Beach with Brent Wagner holding no. a glass of, yep no way yep and so i it's gonna make me cry i got to witness brent witness you win a tony wow. and it was pretty spectacular what a gift <laughs> what a gift <laughs> and talk about the program that he built yeah yeah wow it was oh that's was so spectacular. neat did he have yeah. much emotion about it i can't imagine him having much emotion <laughs> oh you know, it's when when you know someone doesn't often have a lot of emotion, and then you see the emotion. That's how you know oh. it was impactful. I, Something and went we, deep. We, let's we must be clear. He has deep emotion, but he's Absolutely. so he's such he, he outwardly is very measured and and very responsible about always what he professional. Out. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's so wonderful. It, it was meaningful to oh. say the least. It's it oh. was it was amazing. It was I'm amazing. so happy to hear that. 
All right. Are we ready for a lightning round? Yes, Gavin? a final lightning Let's go. round. Yeah? Let's go. Okay. I'm ready. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, James Lipton and the actor studio. I feel Love like it. you might be the generation who will know. We've had some younger actors who are like, no, not familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I know. Okay. Respect. So similar, similar to the questions that he, I was inspired by that format that he has at the end when he asks a bunch of, you know, lightning round questions at the end. Are mm-hmm. you ready? Do you want me to, in their ways, huh, pawn, or are you more excited about first? Because I don't Your mind choice. like, okay, I think I might do a mixture of both because my first impulse sometimes is like bananas, you know, and that's not really a good answer. So I'll try to go quickly, but also <laughs> thoughtfully. You know what? You can even have both. You can say <laughs> bananas. Okay. All right. Okay. What fuels you? Bananas. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not even kidding. Grape nuts, bananas, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries, and an, and an unsweetened almond and coconut milk. Literally, I eat it for breakfast and most of the time for dessert at the end that of the day. That sounds like what I feed my daughter every day. It's berries. Berries is what fuels her. There wow. you go. This is so good. And anything, yeah. anything less literal on yes. that fuels so, you question? <laughs> what fuels me is my, my friends. My dear friends mm. are my life fuel because – Without them, it feels like a very scary world. Yeah. yeah. And I would say creatively, creatively what fuels me is collaboration. I love, I love writing, but it's really fun to pass the song to somebody else and go, hey, let's, can we do something with this? I love, love that. it. Yeah. What drains you? Condescension. Mm. Negativity. I'm trying to be better at holding space for people's pain and negativity, and I think I'm getting better at that. But also an unwillingness to to take care of yourself, lack of self-care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What profession other than your own might you like to do? Oh, I would, it would be some kind of hospitality. I love food and, and hosting gatherings. I don't like going to parties, but I like being sort of curating experiences. So I think it would be some kind of hospitality. I love that. And you could yeah. wear, you could have an outfit, a hospitality oh. uniform outfit. That I want to go amazing. on the Gavin Creel cruise. I want yes. that cruise ship director. That's what oh, I want. That'd be so mm-hmm. fun. Yeah. Yes. What is your favorite form of self-care? I have a routine I do every day where I do 20 minutes meditation, 20 minutes of writing, and like 20 minutes, 15 minutes of exercise. And that is something that I've done for steadily for three years now that I can't live without. And it's not crazy exercise. It's not, I'm not some guru meditator. I'm not some, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert writer. And I'm certainly not Arnold Schwarzenegger lifting weights, but I I like a little bit of something every day. Yeah. What is your favorite comfort food? Ooh, comfort food. Pretty potato chips. Mm, it's terrible. All They're flavors? Not, Any it's kind? Just, yeah. It's got to be kind a specific of, one. I, I'm going to tell you, Cynthia, if there is something I haven't had, I got to try it. Even if I'm like, what? Like in, when I've worked uh, quite a bit in the West End and the UK has crazy potato chip flavors. And I, I'm like, I'm going to try them all. You know, Canada has all dress. Canada. Oh my so gosh. Good. The all dress potato chips. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm so with good. you. Yeah, I love a, I love a potato chip. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. What is your I don't know, do we need to stay PG because we've already broken no. that thing, but no. what's your favorite curse word? It's it's fuck all day long. Fuck fuck fuck. <laughs> but I also I love saying shit balls or or oh, this is terrible. This is a phrase I say as oh, sugar tits. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> but I am like, ah, oh, sugar tits. <laughs> I don't know what that is. That's still somehow like disparaging, but it feels so positive and light and still like, (laughs) ah. Ah, sugar tits. (laughs) Yeah. What are you grateful for? My friends. But I I gave that an answer for another thing. That's the first thing that comes to mind. I'm grateful for my abilities because they feel so tenuous. It feels so borrowed and so... I'm grateful that people care about my, my abilities. That is a gratitude that I don't know that I'm ever really thanked the world f- enough for. That people care about theater. That people seem to care about when I get on stage and try to to make you laugh or make you cry or sing. 
that people care. I'm really grateful that people care mm. and, and oh. that I get the opportunity to do it so that I can feel that love and that care. That is a gift that I wish everybody who ever wanted to be on Broadway or perform, I hope they get to feel that because it is a gratitude I, I am humbled by. And if you could share one more thought before we sign off, what oh, would it be? That's a Terry Grossism that you just did. Terry Gross <laughs> does this amazing interview where she says about listening and how to listen. And it was in the New York Times. She said, "Tell me about yourself is the is the best thing you can say to someone." So I would leave with that. I would say I'm trying to be a better listener, and I think I think I would say to Gavin, and then to share it with everybody, is try to open your ears for two beats more than opening your mouth. Mm -hmm. Because I love to talk, as you can tell. I love to share my thoughts and their tangents. And, oh, I thought of this, and I read this book. And I think it's what makes me exciting and also exhausting. So to try in my effort to try not to be exhausting, it's like, open these up. And let let and I, I do this thing where I go, I really want to say this. And then I send a prayer into the room. Somebody say this. And nine times out of ten, if I wait long enough, somebody will say the thing that I really want to be said. And then I go, Oh, there is a God, there is a spirit, there is something connecting all of us. And if I don't want to wait, then you're also allowed to just say it, toss it out there, because chances are someone's hoping you'll say it. And that person may be shy or not like to talk in public, or not have the courage to speak. And that's where leadership comes in. But sometimes I'm like, there's good leaders in this room. Will somebody please say, why aren't we getting a break? We're tired. <laughs> and if they don't, <laughs> then I have to raise my hand and say, it. open your ears and gently pause your mouth. Gavin, thank you. Oh, what thank you. Lovely... I hate it when it ends. I never want it to end. Oh, love, I love, know. I've been this busy. time with us. This was about so 20 fun. minutes ago, about 20 minutes ago, I thought, Maybe we make this a two-part series and we just keep talking. <laughs> anytime I can be a part of this, I love I loved getting to talk the last time and anytime. I just love this. I love this kind of work and I, I'm really honored that you asked me and I'm grateful that you're doing this work and putting this into the into the ether out there. You never know who's going to hear something that you've done with one of your guests and have their literal lives changed or affirmed yeah. even, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I credit Chelsea for a lot of the more public things that we do because I would be, I am very happy crawled under a rock with a cover over my head. And I feel like as long as she shows up, then I can show up. Mm. So I keep trying Thanks to show for up. Saying that. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Uh, what a beautiful Thanks, thing Gavin. to say. Well, thank, thank you, you, Gavin. Thank Have you a great, so uh, what day is it? It's Friday. You got a show tonight? Five show weekend. Heading into that five okay. show weekend, baby. Okay. Amazing. I feel like I'm going to have an emotional and mental like hangover from that episode. It was just so – such a great conversation with Gavin. But hangover in the best ways. There's just so much juicy stuff to think about. Yes. You're just like, wow, I am – I'm inspired and I'm – I just like need to sit with that. I, the thing that always blows me away – when I've had the chance to talk with Gavin and he was our very first special guest inside the BBC membership at the end of 2021 when we started Broadway Vocal Coach. The thing that always amazes me is his ability to to just truly show up as him and in the most humble way, what he talks about as like the, the Gavin Creel that you see or that you perceive me to be is not, that's not, I don't know who that is. That's not me. I am who I am. I'm still going through the same questions and struggles and thoughts that all of us artists or people in this field, in this industry are going through. And I love his ability to, to speak to that and share so vulnerably. Yeah. I think for someone that we think of at the stature of Gavin, a Tony winner, a multiple Tony nominee, someone who seemingly has had an amazing career, and he has had an amazing career, but to see someone like that, be willing to show up so vulnerably and so openly, I just find really inspiring that, you know, like he talked about sort of taking those layers away 
I think is extra hard for people who do have that measure of success because there is a pressure on them to be that shiny object that we all see all the time. And for him to be that vulnerable and open and honest, I find just really beautiful and really inspiring. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a screenshot, tag us on Instagram at B-Way Vocal Coach, share this episode with a friend and consider leaving us a review. And if you're ready to take your next step in this industry, but aren't entirely sure what that should be, then take our quiz. We'll strategize with you to outline a roadmap to your unique goals. Plus from there, you can book a free consult with us. Visit bwayvocalcoach.com backslash take the quiz. We can't wait to hear your story and help you take the next step in your career. Thanks for listening. Thank you.